Hello everyone, my name is uh, Jerome Stout and uh, I lead Stout Games and last year I released my first game, Dinner Date. And I'm going to talk to you about games being special but not prodigious and how we should be humble in forming a modern medium. So in explaining where I'm, I'm coming from, uh, just about a year ago I released a game called Dinner Date in which you are waiting for a date to show up. You're sitting in your kitchen, you've prepared this meal and the problem is she isn't showing up. And all you can do as a player is you're sitting there waiting and you start finding things to do while you wait. And these things literally are things like looking at the clock and eating bread, eating soup, uh, and eventually drinking wine. And all the while you hear the thoughts of the character uh, narrating uh, what is going on. And as you get through the game, he gets slightly more drunk and the, the narrative becomes increasingly more introversive. And it was, it was very much a reaction at the time. Uh, the game itself was started as a little joke because I, was, uh, I had seen things like uh, the graveyard and the path and, and Dear Esther and I had to do a short university project at the University of Portsmouth and I had like a month and a half so I thought I, I can't do any characters, I can't do anything really, I just have to, one location is too much already. Um, so I thought, I have seen Dear Esther, that is a first-person shooter without shooting, and I'll make Dear Esther without walking, essentially. That was my... Um, and because that started as a joke, I just sort of did it. I didn't really care about uh, commercial success or anything, and it was never intended to be released. It was sort of my little thing. And when I had made it, I thought, okay, this is actually interesting. I could release this academically. I could make this sort of um, builder to understand this, the, the, the Matthias and Stern approach. And then I realized, oh, hang on, actually, I've, I've seen examples. I could also do this commercially, and that has more value in a sense, because then you're no longer saying, I want to get uh, some sort of data out of you, but you're saying, I'm offering you an entertainment product. So in a way, dinner dates, I always feel about this. I was, I was lucky in just being in the right moment that I just thought, I'll just make it. And then I was sort of lucky to, um, to have the chance to extrapolate from this and to work on to... Uh, a functioning game. So for dinner date, I never literally said, I'm going to advance the medium and this is dinner date. I was, uh, it, it was a bit more vague, you know, it was all that sort of student life type of, of ideas. But there is that undercurrent within the industry, it's like that we should advance this medium and you don't always hear it, like not everyone is saying that we should change games and make them better and make them worthy of art. In fact, some, some people on some forums would say, no, don't change anything, you know, we, we hate you experimental games, how dare you intrude upon us? Um, but within select groups and with, with people, there is that, that sort of underbelly feeling, it's quite a vague feeling, it's like we know something is wrong, but not exactly, not exactly what. And I think that is a problem of vagueness, that in, in the sense that if we knew what exactly we were missing, we probably would have made it by now. And in this presentation, I'm sort of going to explain how it's not really necessarily a, a very vague problem, so it sort of leads to a solution. But this solution, quite sadly, leads to a bigger problem, which I'm not completely sure is, is solvable, how to say, within our generation. It's, it's sort of something we have to work around. So to, to start this off, there is always that sort of question which, um, it, it's like throwing the first bomb in a sense, that on a forum you're discussing whatever about games and someone goes, but what are games? And you suddenly realize the rest of this discussion on this forum is now completely ruined because any argument about this is going to, to lead into this, this nightmare of definitions. There are so many definitions about what a game are and a lot of people really say my definition is just true, basically. And you have this entire spectrum of also within academia, which some have very tight definitions and some have extremely wide definitions. And then, of course, people say about one another, your definition is useless. But as a more practical problem, because sort of if we decide what games really are, that isn't going to help us in, in many ways, except if we want to advance them. So we say we have games, we want games to be better, but how do we make them better if we're not exactly sure what we're making better. So you can say, I want to make a better hammer or a better car, but then you know exactly what you want from this hammer or from this car. Now we can 
design by ideal, and I like to call this the platonic fallacy of, of game design, where you say, okay, I have this idea, and I can imagine this game, and it's really good, and you sort of close your eyes, and you can imagine a game where the characters all respond to you very naturally, and, and the world reacts to you, and it's sort of the, almost a Peter Molyneux type level of, of thinking, where you say, you know, this, this is possible, I can imagine it. And the problem with this design by ideal is that it, it can fall down in two ways. And the first is that because this ideal is so far away, anything you make is, is working towards this ideal. But it's never reaching the ideal. Perhaps the ideal, for instance, is technically impossible. There is um, a, a nice thing called Hamlet on the holodeck. It's sort of this, this idea that in the future we'll have the Star Trek holodeck and then we can play Hamlet on this holodeck. That isn't much use to us right now as, as, as theories goes, because if we want to get out of bed this morning or tomorrow morning and we want to work on a game, then we can't wait around for the holodeck. And secondly, because this, this idea is so far away, we don't actually know whether it's good. So, see, the problem is I can imagine a really beautiful song, but that doesn't mean you can actually write and produce exactly what I have in my head. So sort of opposed to this is what I think is the Aristotelian fallacy of game design. It's where you say, I'm going to derive all my theory from the essence of games. You know, this is what games are about, and I'm going to, to express this. I'm going to extrapolate what they are. And that has the problem of, of all Aristotelian philosophy, where the logic is really, really clever, but it's all ultimately derived from Aristotle saying, a man is this. His essence is this, ergo, and then follows his whole theory. And throughout centuries, the theory about what a man is completely shifts. It, it becomes obvious that Aristotle, like any philosopher, has a completely arbitrary idea. You know, this is a man because I say it's a man, because it's so obvious. And you get that with games as well, where someone says, you know, the essence of games is fun, or it's competition. And all his logic after that is completely sound. But the problem is, perhaps in a hundred years, it won't be completely obvious to anyone that games are about any particular thing. So there's a safety net, which is uh, designed by history. And this is, of course, done throughout, uh, throughout art, art history, where you start with, you know, I want to draw a particular thing. Where, where do I get this? And you just happen to have a goddess lying around who used to be a fertility idol, but now we have the goddess Venus. And it quickly became this excuse for artists to paint a nude woman. And it's extremely effective. And throughout generations, you see better and better versions of the Venus. You can't always say, you know, it, you, the tastes change per centuries, but the technology, the technique get better, but also the ideas get better, because each generation is not merely drawing a better Venus. They're also adding to this their particular ideas about what constitutes, uh, what constitutes beauty, what emotions you can express in a painting. But of course, if you don't have the Venus, and this is our, our sort of vague problem, we go, all right, yes, we want to advance games, but if we keep doing that, we're essentially doing what the industry is doing right now, is, is making better shooters, as it were. Um, and that's the problem. We, we could say we don't have the Venus, so we can't improve upon the Venus. And here's one I, I just like to include for argument's sake, because I, I like the thought that in a hundred years, people will look back on us, and they'll see our, our sort of petty what is a game discussions, and sort of our problems, and to them it will seem obvious. But evidently, if you, if you start thinking about um, what will future historians think about us, that is, that is just a sort of theoretical nightmare, because you can't know and, and it's impractical. So then we can say, you know, forget about all this, forget about this theory and forget about how we can design a game. Let's just experiment, let's, let's go wild. And I think the problem there again is that you can do this in two ways. You can do this sort of falsely. You can say, okay, I'm going to close my eyes and I'm going to make something completely new. And then you end up with something looking suspiciously what there already was. And what you've done is you've just basically hidden your sources. You said, I'm experimenting. And then you make something which was already there, but you deny it. You deny you derived it from anything. Or you actually let go. But then you lose, as it were, the sophistication of the Venus. So you might draw something completely new, but this new thing has no history. It has no previous people making it. And that means that you cannot safely do it. It's like um, you can make several experimental games, and perhaps one will, will work. But again, if, you, if you're someone who has to get up in the morning and make games for a living, then this experimentation is quite a dangerous thing, of course, as well, because you know, you could get a thousand monkeys typing away on typewriters until one of them produces a good game for you. 
and that technically works. But of course, you're, you're continuously putting at risk because these monkeys don't know the previous history of all the plays. So the safe thing seems sort of what we have plus one, and, and as I said, this is exactly what the history of, of games looks like, where we go from return to Castle Wolfenstein to Half-Life 2 and um, Heroes of Might and Magic to, to Skyrim recently. And it's, it's easy, I think, for this art scene or for certain people arguing in favor of the art scene, kind of going, oh, these games are still, you know, we're still holding guns and we're still doing exactly the same thing. But it's so much better now, though, because... The, these games have actually advanced. I mean, not just graphically, that's the other sort of, of uh, cliché argument against uh, the evolution of games. But they have evolved in terms of gameplay to the point that if you put uh, a, a younger person in front of a game from your own childhood, to them it may seem as absurd as, as films from our, our parents' era seem to us now as slow and as uh, complicated or ununderstandable because we miss that level of... Um, our games now spoil us, in a sense. They, they are so much better. Of course, I say this, but then I, I have that sort of problem where I say, okay, all we can do is uh, advance the medium by making what there already is, but slightly better. That is what everyone is doing, so you know, we, we can go home as art scene, in a sense. We, there's nothing we can do which, which the industry can't. And here, here I like to say, if I would go, okay, I can say it lacks edification, it lacks a certain sophistication, I want more out of these games. And I go, okay, I can imagine a game, but then I fall in this platonic fallacy where, yes, I can imagine a game where all the characters spawn. Does that mean it will work? Does that mean it will be fun to play this game? But here is sort of the solution, because I have seen um, sophistication before. And here's a painting I really like, and it's called The Church in Danger. Um, um, by Jean-Georges Fibert, I think. And uh, the nice thing about this painting is it always makes me laugh. It's my favorite comedic painting. But there's a lot of other culture. For instance, if I could be whimsical for a moment, I could tell you what uh, Amélie Poulain from the film The Destin Fabuleux d'Amélie Poulain likes. She likes to look at other people's faces in the cinema. She likes to dip her hand into sacks of seeds. She likes to crack Crème Brûlée and Skip Stones on St. Martin's Canal. And here's another painting uh, by Eugène de Blas called The Catch of the Day, which again is a very humorous painting. And here's a scene from the ballet Capella in which uh, Swanilla is, is ushered by her friends to confront a love rival who's hiding in a cupboard and is also a robot, as happens in ballets. And here's a scene from uh, Les Miserables, which is a book which traumatized me to the extent that I can't discuss the final chapter without crying with anyone, which um, made it very hard for me to explain why I was very sad. And people would ask, and I'd try to explain, and I would just completely break down again. And it's a very happy scene uh, called Welcome Footsteps by Lawrence Alma Tadema. And, you know, I could go on sort of pressing the space bar and, and revealing more art, which I like, because there's a huge wealth and extent of art. I could do this the rest of the day. I could do this the rest of the week. We could, we could sit around listening to Bach at least for a few days just to get his oeuvre down. And, and here's sort of my problem, is that I do see this very wide uh, series, this sort of edification of, um, of culture. But then when I look at games, it feels like a different world. It doesn't feel like this, this world of art, which I like, and this world of games, which I like, touch. And it always leaves me very sad, because I, I play a game, and I have a good time, and then I read a book, and I suddenly go, oh yes, this is what it feels like to see sharply again. This is what it feels like to have these other emotions. Because these games relate to me. I can relate to this, this uh, small story about a love rival in a ballet. I can relate to the idea of carrying flowers. I can relate, evidently, to, to Les Miserables, and I can completely let it destroy me because it's that much something I could experience. It's something very close to home. And it, it would seem almost like a... Um, uh, it's a strawman argument which I can make, which is that someone might say, well, you know, but these artists, they were geniuses, and we in games, we've been working for 40 years, we haven't produced anything like this, but games are different, you know, it's all, it's all different now. Um, but that is, that is a complete fabrication. This is why it's a strawman argument, of course, because I knew this. Um, because these pieces of art have been produced 
not by one genius um, sort of when he was 20 and a bit bored and thought I'd, I'll do something special and I happen to be a genius. But these paintings you can bring back, so you can see elements in this painting for instance which you can get from the Renaissance, but in the Renaissance you wouldn't actually get this painting. Like her pose is very too dynamic for the Renaissance, the colors are too vibrant. The theme of a man carrying flowers to his lover was something you could do in the Renaissance, but people didn't have the same emotions. There was a sort of limited scope. And the Renaissance obviously derives before that from um, the classical Rome, and classical Rome derives from classical Greece, and classical Greece from archaic Greece, and archaic Greece from Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia from ancient archaic Egypt. And before that, we sort of get to this, this point, which is, art at a point where we don't understand why it wasn't exactly made, because it was made 35,000 years ago. The, the, the original, so the earliest cave painting was 35,000 years ago, and we're not exactly sure why. It could be a, a magic chant. It could be that they ran out of actual animals, so they decided to draw animals, as if that would allow them to capture them. And it's this completely different um, world, you might say, because we now have so much culture built up on us, like several generations of culture, that to this it seems obvious what you could improve. But if you were actually there at, at this sort of cave painting, all you could do was make something slightly better. And this uh, philosophy is, is addressed by um, Sir Joshua Reynolds, who was the um, director of the British Academy. This is all the way back in the 18th century. And it's lovely how you can see in his talk, this is still very much alive, sort of this idea of we should repeat history, but slightly better. So I'll read a quote <laughs> from him to you. It is indisputably evident that a great part of every man's life must be employed in collecting materials for the exercise of genius. Invention, strictly speaking, is, more, is little more than a new combination of those images which have been previously gathered and deposited in memory. Nothing can come of nothing. He who has laid up no materials can produce no combinations. A student unacquainted with the attempts of former adventurers is always apt to overrate his own abilities, to mistake the most trifling excursions for discoveries of the moment, and every coast new to him for a newfound country. If by chance he passes beyond his usual limits, he congratulates his own arrival at those regions which they who have steered a better course have left long behind them. And in this is, in some sense, a very scary message for game design. Where if games do go, you know, we're unique, we have to reinvent all the rules, then what they're saying is, we're going to do it all again. Basically, you know, we had human development, we had all this artistic development, generations which uh, slaved hard and saved their labor, as it were, and we're just going to throw it away. And the scary thing is that if, if we'd allow games to evolve with, with sort of this history plus one type of scheme, it would take a considerable number of years to get back to a certain academic level. Because it's not a question of getting some genius in there who will make the game which changes everything. The, the actual problem is that no single genius can do this. We need successive generations of people to do this. But of course, the solution seems somewhat trivial going from this, where you say, well, we, we have this art history and we have uh, game history deriving more perhaps from sport or something, and we, we see that these games evolve. These games have become amazing products. And at the same time, art is not dead. It's still alive. We can still derive from it. Well, so what we should do, and this sort of follows with sort of Joshua Reynolds, is that we say, okay, we're going to get everything, everything we um, have so far. We're going to combine the best of, artist, of art, we're going to combine that with the best of games, and we're going to combine that with cinema and, and anything we can throw in. You know, we're going to take our lessons. Um, and then we, we make this product, which I've left out of frame, um, because the problem here is that these evolutions that which games made and which uh, art made may be incompatible. And I'm just going to stick my neck out to explain why, because I'm going to to do this based firstly on Uncharted 3. Because Uncharted 3 is, is a narrative experience and it, it sort of poses itself as this. You know, you're, uh, you're Nathan Drake and you're going on a big adventure. But when you get the game, you actually get two different things. And in one thing you have this game in which you are Nathan Drake and you're running around on ledges and you're jumping, you're doing all these, these spectacular things, you're shooting and, and that, that's basically it really. But you do all these spectacular things 
And at the other end, you have Nathan Drake who has emotions, who cares about things, who has his ancestry. But never in the gameplay does Drake care about his ancestry, about, um, about the puzzle as it were. Nathan Drake is trying to run and shoot in most of the gameplay. And then back to the story, where in the story it's never referenced that Nathan Drake shoots about 700 people, which surely someone would find slightly objectable. But nobody mentions this because then you'd ruin the gameplay. And in the gameplay, nobody starts talking about the story because that would damage the gameplay. And they form this sort of very tight balance, which you can see in nearly all games which have narrative experiences or uh, whatever words you want to hang on that, where you have these big action scenes, very elaborate, very, very momentous, everything is going on. And then somehow you always end up stuck in an elevator with people talking. And this is actually a very good thing, um, because these action scenes, they're very dynamic. They can do a lot of things. You have, you have health, you have statistics, you have your momentum in the world, and the game keeps what you do. So you walk forward and the game doesn't say, okay, you release forward now, I'm teleporting you back. No, you, you keep your momentum, you keep your place in the world. If you destroy a crate, the crate will be destroyed. If you shoot enemies dead, they'll be dead. And this works because the game has no idea what you're doing. So you could be playing the game, you could be thinking, I'm on a winning streak, you know, I'm shooting everyone in the head, like one big go. The game doesn't know you're happy, the game doesn't particularly care that you're happy. All the game knows is I have all these statistics, and if at the end I see that your health is zero, then I'm going to kill you and I'm teleporting you back to the last save point. Or if all the enemies are zero, then I'm going to play the victory music and you've won. And this, is, this works very well because the game doesn't judge you during these scenes. Basically, it lets you play and it lets you play in your own head. It, makes you, it lets you make your own story in this bit. Whereas with the narrative, you get this type of gameplay where, and this isn't even Half-Life. This is if you had branching in Half-Life. Um, where you go from node to node, it's basically, do you want option A or option B? You can choose now. Okay, I want option A. Okay, sit back for 30 seconds while we play the audio sample of option A. And the first scene has this high fidelity, which you can't get in the second scene, not for some sort of design reason, not because developers don't like it, because they don't want to have real narrative experience. They'd love to have real narrative experience. But the problem is, that there's only so many lines that the voice actor for any of the persons in the game can record. He can't record the 10,000 lines you'd need to get this huge, very affluent experience. That would be like drawing every frame. As, I, as a child, when I worked on a platform game, I had this idea that I would draw every frame you could possibly have in the game, and then I'd program this huge branching tree, where if you say jump, I'm going to load the, the, the image where you have jumped. Um, but that's impractical. It's a, it's a content problem. So these games have developed a form of pendulum. They're very advanced, of course, because this is the, the development of, uh, of games for generations. So they have developed a pendulum where you get these, these very, uh, very tight action scenes. You're doing lots of things, and you get drawn into the character. You become sort of... You, you can't help it. Even if the gameplay isn't particularly good or anything, I still get drawn in. I sort of see um, the world as my own. And then you put me in this narrative scene where I have absolutely no choice, and yet somehow it still resonates with me. I still go, oh, they're talking about me when they mean Gordon, or um, yes, I can see how Nathan Drake would care about this because I did all these action scenes. So they have developed this pendulum, and in this idea where we take everything we have combined and then we put it into something new, we're just going to combine Le Fabuleux Destin d'Amelie Poulain with the best of game design. Uh, as it has to offer. And the problem is, I can perfectly imagine all the narrative bits of uh, Amélie Poulain as these linear scenes in games, because we, we essentially have evolved to a point where we have bits of film in games rendered real time. So I, I can imagine those bits. But there isn't really the shooting in Amélie Poulain which I can use. And once you try and find something, what can I do if I'm not shooting? And you could say, okay, there could be puzzles, but then you lose the high fidelity because the shooting has, has thousands of variables. It's very exciting. Everything has its own health, its own statistics, and the puzzle is bring object A to B, which sort of leaves us with just a narrative. I and mean, it can be a branching narrative. It can be an interactive narrative. But and I think this is the big problem where if you want to do 
art, like classical type of art in a game, you can do it as long as there is shooting in this classical art or there's some form of action which is not, the game doesn't have to understand it, it just has to go with it. The moment the game has to understand something, because the game has to choose, does Amelie say A, B or C, then the game can't cope with all these variables and sort of has to condense them down into this path. And that can be very depressing. I was at this point about a month ago when I thought, oh God, I'm just going to make interactive films for the rest of my life and I'm going to feel proud about it because I do it in games, even though I could just, why don't I just write a book? That's sort of always my, when I hit rock bottom, I always go, why don't I just write a book? Um, and it seems this is idea far away on the right kind of edges towards this, when you imagine it, a platonic ideal. Because I have no idea how it would work, but I can imagine it. I can imagine this, this wonderful high fidelity version of Amelie, and I'm imagining it right now. That doesn't mean I can make it technically, and it doesn't mean I can, I can make it in a way that's actually fun. What I'm actually imagining is, is basically just a branching dialogue tree. However, in complete sort of opposition to the evolution of, of games, there was at one point the graveyard, which is a till of tills game. And in the graveyard, you play an old woman who is on, on the graveyard, and she's walking to a bench. And if you walk too fast, she starts stumbling. So you sort of give a little pause, and then you walk on, and this takes a long time to get to the bench. And by the time, as a player, when I was a first-time player, I was going, what's going to happen? And you sit down, and there's a very sad song about how everyone she ever knew has died by now. She's that old, and she herself really wants to die. And she's sort of waiting for that moment. And then the song ends, and the game says, well, you can get back up and walk off the graveyard. And the complete nihilism of this gameplay is very striking, because it completely resonates with, with this particular story. And in a way, it's a devolution. We've, we've actually just said, okay, we have these shooters, and we're going to rip out everything, everything we can find, which is um, high fidelity, but not one thing, because the graveyard doesn't have a dialogue option. Rather, what it has is walking. And walking is, I think, at this moment for art games, certainly, like the one thing we have. Like, we, can see, we can't shoot in most, in most art uh, games. Like, you can't do Les Miserables with shooting, but you can perhaps do it with walking. It's like this very hopeful and yet intimately depressing thing because you kind of go, what if you can't walk? Um, and here is, is sort of, well, here's the, the advancement, of course, where you get sort of the graveyard and, and the restaurant and dinner date and the path. And each of these games has found, like, one thing we can do, one thing the game isn't completely aware of you doing. You're not completely choosing something. It's like your story. You're moving forward. Or you're deciding to look at the clock. And the game doesn't have to condense this down. But of course, this is only one line of, uh, of fidelity. And in this, this is why I say we should be humble. Because what we've done, we've literally devolved games. We're not as good as games, because what we have is this little bit of games, and they have 40 years ahead of us, as it were. This type of gameplay doesn't really exist. So we're competing in this field with games which had 40 years ahead of us. And it's no wonder that a lot of gamers say, oh, you know, yes, it's a rubbish game, or it's not a game. Because we are very much back in, in some way. It's like we're saying we have all this fidelity in these other games, but in our game you can walk. And we do really ma amazing things with walking, and that's very surprising in a way, that walking can be a very nice thing to do. But at the same time, we're lagging behind. So. And here again is sort of that, that sort of conundrum where I go, oh no, I'm going to make perhaps not interactive films, but I'm going to make games in which you walk for the rest of my life. You know, and how do I do something where I can't walk? What if the characters sit down for coffee? What do I do? Um, and this is where, uh, this is the most profoundly strange thing, where when I was studying in Portsmouth, um, I had this theory of symbiosis, and this is the solution to the problem I just outlined. And I discovered the problem about a month ago, but I had the solution a while before, and I now realize why the solution never made sense until I had the problem. What I had with symbiosis was, what you actually do in the game is that you build the sensation you're in some way one with the character. You're using it as, um, as a way of drawing the player in, in the same way that a film will start with a very, very special scene, kind of drawing you in. And afterwards, the film can do anything. It can bore you for 10 minutes, but you're sold on that one thing. 
Um, and what most games do, they, they want to have this, this sensation, and you get this with this fidelity, like you move forward and you're forward in the world. The game isn't going to say one step forward. No, you know, you're there, as it were. And this necessity of games to, to mix this violence with, with narrative is very much like all other art forms getting around their problems. And I, I like the problem with ballet, where you always get one of the main characters has to be asleep or incapacitated at some point. Because the actor simply cannot dance for two hours straight, so you have to get him asleep. And usually it doesn't make sense to just make him disappear out of the story, so you drug him. Or in the, in the case of, of Romeo and Juliet, of course, Juliet pretends she's dead. And in that way, you get Juliet on stage, lying there, not dancing for, for at least a good half hour, while other people dance, and they sort of don't really know what to do, so her maidens come in and do a nice wake-up Juliet dance. And it's this very painful dance because Juliet is dead. Um, but what this does is working around its problems. Like games, we can't get that high fidelity with, with narrative. We can't choose this narrative unless we branch. So we work around it. We give you action scenes, you're drawn in, and then we do this narrative scene, you're drifting away, and then we do an action scene, we draw you back in, and then you get this narrative scene, you're drifting away, and an action scene. And it works in this sort of very pendulum-like way. Very beautiful. You get this sensation, you're one. Through this constant interaction with the game world. And perhaps sometimes you can't interact, but then you're still resonating. It's like you're still drunk from the interaction, and they can do anything with you, what they want. But what I'm interested in is, what if this sort of problem doesn't have to exist? And I can, of course, say, you know, I'm going to make a game and then sort of naively walk into a wall. This is what happened a month ago. Um, or I go, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm, oh, I programmed this. And the problem is still there. I can't get around this problem. I don't think anyone can get around this problem unless we do speech synthesis. But, you know, we can't. We have to get up tomorrow morning and make a game, not in 10 years. So what I like to think about is, what if we get closer not to the experience of being the character, of making the choices, but rather get closer to the sensation of acting? What if you portray the character? Because I've, I've done stage acting, and when you play a character, you do get these very intense emotional experiences out of this sensation. But you're bound by a script, and if you break from the script, your fellow actors are going to be extremely angry with you because they have absolutely no way to respond to anything you do but the script. And this is, of course, where uh, there was a screenshot of Dinner Date, but it disappeared. Um, this is where Dinner Date came from, where you get these actions to do. What do you do sitting at a kitchen table? Well, you, you tap the table, you look at the clock. And what I found some players to do is um, they put a, a let's play on the internet. They, they play a narrative linear game and then they record themselves talking over my voiceover of the game uh, about their own thoughts. And you hear Julian say something like, um, the bread is nice. And the player suddenly goes, oh yes, I must eat bread. I, I, you know, the story, it makes sense. You get a, a sense of cognitive satisfaction out of combining these things. So the goal for the next game is to give the player the sensation of acting. I, I have now sort of come to terms that unless I make everything extremely vague, I can't give the player any choices within the narrative. Because then you always get to branching and then I lose all my fidelity. But I can give the player this sensation of acting in the sense that if there is a very sad scene, you give the player control over the facial expressions of the main character. Um, which sounds crazy in a way, but just give this control to the player, and the player will look very, very happy during this very sad scene, and the game just ignores him, like, um, you know, you have your high fidelity, I'm not going to judge you. The player can then enhance his experience by going, oh, this is a sad scene, I better look very sad. In the same sense that as an actor, you try to find that slight resonation with the character. And with this, if you enhance this, and this becomes an input problem and several other problems. But if you just say, this game is linear, but as a player, I give you all the tools to be an actor. I give you your script, I give you your costume, I give you the other actors, everything is going to be perfect. And if you fail, I'm not actually going to judge you because you know, I'm not smart enough to judge you player anyway. So you, know, you do your thing. And if the player thinks, I feel very happy looking um, looking sad during very happy scenes because my character feels very sad during happy scenes. 
then that is the player's own reward. Then that is like feeling you're playing a good song on an instrument, or that is feeling you're playing very well, that is feeling um, you do something well, that's feeling a success moment in a first-person shooter, even though the shooter doesn't judge you personally. And in that way, I theorize, we can create a narrative experience, but it sort of becomes a choice. Either we can give the player control over his own fate, or the illusion of control, but then we have to lose fidelity, because the game has to respond, the game has to understand, and the game says there are three things you can choose. No more, because otherwise, you know, the artists are going to kill us. So then as a player, you, you lose all your fidelity again. But if the game says there are three choices, doesn't really matter though which you do, and I'm giving you all these tools to get, get your sense of fidelity, to get your immer immersion in the world, then that can get a very rich experience. So in conclusion, what I believe is that the problem of, of vagueness, the sense of longing within games that we must make them better, we must advance them, comes in part from an incapacity to actually combine things we have seen before and we really like from films or cinema or, or music in games. Because the actual problem with games is that the entire progression of games for 40 years has steered away in such a course that we cannot combine these action scenes with our really beautiful narrative, because we can never work that shotgun into a beautiful game. And art games have this very brilliant, strange thing where we go, okay, well, the player just walks. And suddenly you get, it's very strange, you just do one thing, you walk. And you already get this tighter sense of immersion with the world. And the way forward, in my view, for some of these games, if we want to get this, this classical art into games, is to change what the player does to say, well, I see you want immersion, so I'm not going to give you choice, because that is not going to ultimately give you this immersion. I'm very sorry, but basically it's, it's life. And if we change these expectations of the player, what we can do is create experiences which are rich to him, but in a completely different way. Yes. Thank you.